We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. We like to think we're in charge of our own lives. And all we need to put our house in order is a well-thought-out plan and determination to see it through. However, my witness today believes we live in haunted houses and sleep in memory's unmade bed. So if ghosts are spoiling our plans, what sort of ghosts and how do we dispel them? Making a welcome return to the podcast is Jungian analyst James Hollis, who brings half a century of experience to his many books, including the latest one, A Life of Meaning, Relocating Your Centre of Spiritual Gravity, and one of the chapters is devoted to this very subject. So what do you mean when you say we live in haunted houses and sleep in memory's unmade bed? Well, it's a metaphor, of course, to suggest that there are many clusters of energy intrapsychically, that is to say, swirling within us at all given times. Once in a while, we might step aside from our life and look back and say, uh, why did I do it that way? Or what, what, what froze me at that moment when I wanted to do something differently? And it's in those moments one begins to realize there are other independent energies, by that independent from the ego's awareness or control. Now, we all have, for example, parental complexes, even an orphan does. It's a special kind of parent complex. But these have been powerful experiences in our lives. And the word complex itself is a neutral word. It's not a negative word. It just means a cluster of energy. The question is, what is that energy? What is its core script? That is to say, what is the story? Perhaps fragmentary, but a story nonetheless, a narrative trying to make sense of things. For example, if a toddler touches a hot iron, it now has a new experience, and it may for a while associate any silver shiny object as a threat. And so that story needs to be differentiated and say, well, some objects are useful and some are hostile to you. So the point is, we all have these energies that are operating autonomously. I think as late as 1800, a really thoughtful person could have gotten away with saying, well, I know who I am. I'm a person of good intentions. I mean, well, I'm pretty much the author of my own journey and so forth. Meanwhile, Kant in um, Germany and, or, you know, in Prussia at the time and Hume in Edinburgh are undermining this whole notion that we ever know the nature of reality itself. What we rather swim in is the subjective experiences of the outer world. And so, you and I are two different individuals. We could look at the same fruit, let's say, an object, a, an orange, and experience different oranges with different associations and different stories attached to it. And, you know, that's perfectly knowable and understandable. But in reality, when these things are operative, often there are other agents, I'll put it that way, there are other agencies that are making choices for us that we're not aware of. Just to give a quick example. There is in each of us a frightened and compliant child, and there might be a point where it gets triggered, and we realize we just sacrificed our integrity, or we kept our mouth shut when we wanted to say something, and that old, old defense just was uh, willing to sort of reconstitute its program, and it undermined my adult position in, in the choices and behaviors of that moment. I think of it sometimes as a bit like the small child leaps forward, grabs hold of the steering wheel and drives us into the ditch. We thought we were going to Massachusetts and suddenly we're in the ditch because this force has taken charge of the, the automobile. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, you know, I've actually used that metaphor with individuals to say you wouldn't let your child drive your automobile. They can't even see over the dash. But metaphorically, that happens all the time because we, we have infantile aspects of ourselves or past experiences that, when triggered, have the power to rise up, usurp 
control of the ego consciousness and give us a response. Fight, flight, freeze. You know, these are, these are old patterns of adaptation and protection. And we're never without them. So the question in any given moment, I've asked people to phrase it this way, of any choice that I'm making, what is that in service to really inside of me? And I had to insert that word really because I can't trust my first response. My first response will be to say, oh, but this and this situation requires me to respond in this way. And that's how we rationalize it. But in fact, it might be an old area of avoidance or an old area of compliance or an old power complex within us that just, again, exercised its program. Now, obviously, our ancestors had exactly the same kind of problems, but they Mm -hmm. saw it in a, a different way. So we're rather sort of joking when we say ghosts, because Mm -hmm. previous generations would have actually believed in ghosts. But in a sense, we can be haunted by our parents. You know, my parents died a few years ago. Your parents died Mm -hmm. much, much long further ago. But I wouldn't be so surprised if sometimes your parents still pop up in your life. Could you give us an example of how they still materialize? Sure, it's true for all of us. Because, you know, as a character in Faulkner novel says, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. So we need to realize that in the psyche, there's no time zone. There's no past or present or future. There is the experience of your life. And all that is still part of who you are and part of your life experience. And any part of it can be triggered at any given moment. Now, now an example of that is a person can have a dream of someone they they knew back in primary school. They haven't seen for 40 years, let's say. But there they are in living color. And it's like, what happened to Joey or Susan? Well, they never went away. They've always been there. And something that's going on today has just triggered that. And it's not probably about them as much as it is the kind of memory you have or association you have with them that was the analogy that got triggered in today's experience. So, you know, we're always running today's experiences through the lens of the past. We always are. That's partly how you learn. It's partly how you build on your experience. But there's also a tendency there to tend to the same old, same old, which is what produces patterns in our lives. Another good example of hauntings, for example, is the patterns of our lives, particularly the patterns that are counterproductive to us or maybe harmful to us or others, but we can't seem to let go of them. And those patterns indicate the presence of another cluster of energy. Uh, You can call them splinter personalities, that in a given moment you can have that splinter activated with its storyline and with a set of behaviors that follow and predictable outcomes. And so no wonder change is difficult for us because we realize how much resistance there will be intrapsychically. We, you know, we often casually say, well, I want to grow and develop and be this kind of person, that kind. Well, but then we don't do that. Why is it we don't do that? Well, again, because there are other psychic presences. And you're right. In the past, our ancestors, the farther back you go, the more this would be the case would ascribe that to curses placed upon them by somebody else or possession by an evil spirit. And in the shamanic tradition, what we would call mental illness was that some evil spirit had entered that person's psychic life or spiritual life and, you know, taken part of it away or is is feeling neglected and therefore is exacting this particular cost. So the shaman's summons was to enter that space also, identify. What is the offended energy or what is the part that is acting out and to try to deal with it, negotiate with it, make it conscious. And in doing so, you see, it's, it's on, on the street, that might sound, quote, crazy, but it's not. It's going on anyhow. It's making the conversation conscious, because if you don't do that, you can be sure that it's going on regardless in an unconscious way. And it's not just dead people that could be haunting us. It's dead beliefs and dead ideas too. Can you tell me about that? Of course. Well, in the 1880s, remember, Ibsen became celebrated for his play Ghosts. And there's a famous passage there that says essentially what you just said. When you listen to gossip in the streets, you realize that we're all pushing around dead ideas and dead customs and practices and dead inhibitions. You look at the newspaper and you realize there are ghosts present there, you know, and he was talking about life, you know, in Oslo, in Norway, 
but Ibsen's point was well taken that there are cultural forms such as gender limitations. You know, when I was a child, I was told boys can do this and they can't do that. Girls can do this and they can't. Well, the last few decades have been demonstrating that those are social constructs. You know, they're not inherent to nature or divinity. And when people are freed of those constrictions, they often are able to step into a much fuller humanity. And in particular, we're haunted by the unfinished business of our parents. Yes. One of Jung's most telling comments, and I think about it every day, is the greatest burden a child must bear is the unlived life of the parent. So what that means is I'm, as a child, constantly observing as to how my parents are coping or failing to cope with certain things. I learn where they're stuck, where they're not stuck. I'll give you a quick example. Last hour, I was talking with someone whose wife is afraid of flying, and now her fears have infected their children. Their children want to go various places with the father. But, you know, she's forbidding air travel, which really limits them geographically. So they want to go to France, for example, to be specific, but they live in California, so they're not going to get there by driving, that's for sure. So, And it's a very long boat trip. Long boat trip, yes. But there's a specific example where there's a learned fear. And even the unlearned fears are still absorbed and inculcated. And so the child will then feel the same limitation and be stuck also, or they'll be spending a lot of energy trying to get unstuck. I know in my own life, I spent a lot of energy sort of serving those limitations because I knew no better, but something inside was also protesting. And so I was also trying to break free from them, you know, little knowing fully the, the extent to which what I really had to do was just accept that my life was a different journey. And I'm here to live in a different way with great respect and love for my parents. In what way were you trying to live your parents' life then? Well, they both were influenced profoundly by deaths in their family and by the Great Depression. And so they lived lives of comparative poverty. My father was pulled out of primary school and sent to work when the Depression came. And so his thought of travel, his thought of maybe becoming a physician was ended right there. And he spent his life working in a factory. And my mother was a secretary. And their basic message to me was don't ask for things. You'll just be disappointed. Don't go out and try for things because we don't really know how the world works. And it wasn't so much directly, it was what I was interpreting as a child. And that's why I say in my early years, I found myself in avoidant behaviors because I was picking that up from them. You know, even to go away to university as I ultimately did, was for them like traveling to Mars. Now, they loved and supported me, but they had no idea what that experience really was. So I had to be out there on my own. And that's what I began to realize. You know, a lot of the other students here in the dormitory where I'm living don't seem to be so fearful. They don't seem to be so inhibited. They don't seem to be lacking in permission to do things. And that's when I first began to realize how constricted my family of origin had been. And again, I say this without criticism. They lived the best life they could under the circumstances that life presented them. How it was a life that was too constricted and too narrow. Something in me yearned to breathe freely and to move off. And I'll give you one specific example. And this one continues to kind of break my heart. When my mother was dying of cancer and she knew that she had a short time to live, since her father, whom she hadn't really known, he was a Swedish man who died in American coal mine collapse. And I thought she might be pleased to know that a book was coming out and it was going to be published in Sweden and it was and so on. I just happened to mention that to her because I thought it was something for her to feel good about as she's dying. And she was aghast that I'd even written a book because now I was out there. Now her response was protective. Unfortunately, the fear was also constrictive. It's like, well, you, you shouldn't do that. What if people say bad things? And it was, it was that kind of primitive fear. It's like, well, if you're out there now, the key is to stay hidden so nobody can be critical of you. And that's the level of unlived life and constriction that they live with, sadly. And again, I may sound critical. I, I'm nothing but sympathetic to their circumstances. 
And you say that one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves, and I invite everybody listening to ask themselves this question, do you have permission to ignore or are you subject to your parents' wishes? Mm -hmm. Well, and you have to have permission for your own life, you see. And I, what I was just citing was my lack of permission. So at some point you have to seize it and realize, you know, this is the only journey you get. And if you don't, it doesn't make sense to you. And you do have all kinds of internal systems like your feeling function, your energy system, your dreams, other such things that tell us ultimately if what we're doing is right for us. And they remind us when we're off course. The paradox here is we all have to adapt to the circumstances of family of origin and to the time and place in which you, history has placed you. But having done that, you realize it also limits you, you see. And something else inside is wishing a deeper form of expression. You know, if you're the carrier of the life force, well, how do you serve life by shutting that down? That's not per se about ambition. It's really about accountability. It's not about trying to prove something to somebody else. It's about honoring what is within me that is wishing expression. For example, my parents would have been thrilled if I'd stayed in our same town of origin, city of origin, and worked for the local telephone company. Because in their world, that was a stable job. We'd always need telephones. And, you know, it was safe compared to life in the factory where I had worked during the summers. So everything they did, they did with the best of intentions. And many times we as parents will always try to do what we think is best for our children. But do we really know what's best for them and what their callings are in life? And the truth is many parents, whether they acknowledge it or not, are wanting their children to grow up and emulate their values and come out with uh, religious and political views that are similar to theirs. And if they're going to insist perhaps on getting married or forming a relationship, they want that person to be wholly acceptable to the parents and so forth. I mean, it's, it's a rare parent that can really let go of a child and say, this child's not an extension of me. This is someone who has passed through me en route to their own journey. And what I have to do is give them as much stability and encouragement and support as I can, but they're here to live that journey, you know? Do I describe it in the abstract? It sounds pretty obvious, but in reality, it's a rare experience. And that's why most people don't have permission to live the journey that their soul is wanting to have expressed. And often people don't really even know what their soul wants them to do. That's I right. was talking to a client who was about 30, and we were talking about the impact of having a parent who sort of wanted everything done, in this case it was a woman, her way. Mm -hmm. And my client had dealt with that by sort of saying yes in public and then sneaking around and doing what she really wanted to do behind mm -hmm. her mother's back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously the problem was that's how she was approaching her relationship, because I'm a couple therapist was my main idea. But the second problem was, if you are forever saying yes, and lying about what you're doing, it's very difficult to actually work out what it is you really want yourself. Well, that's true. And, and what happens in those adaptations to the reality of the world around us, we often lose contact with our own guiding sources. And every child at some level knows what's right for him or her, but they're not able to act on it. They're still dependent and needy and lacking the skills and the information and the tools to function as an adult. So they have to make these adaptations. But again, the paradox is with the adaptation, there is a greater and greater possibility of separation from one's own reality, one's own truth. So people can pass a lie detector test and say, I really don't know what I want for my life. And I don't really know what to do with my life. And that, that's a sign that there, you know, something inside, some picture of the world, some roadmap that they've been serving really is exhausted. And it's time to move on. But there are that difficult in between. And that's often when people wind up in therapy. It's that difficult in between where something no longer works if it did work. And something else that's better hasn't emerged yet. So you sort of have to hold that 
tension of ambiguities there as best one can until what is right for you, that person emerges. Marie Louise Tron said once, I'm not God. She said, I don't know what's right for a person, but I do know that there is something in them that knows what's right for them. So I try to respect that. I listen carefully. I pay attention carefully in the hopes that that individual will observe that and internalize that as well. And what is right for them then will emerge for them. And hopefully they'll have the courage to live it. Because as Jung pointed out, this, this work is only in part psychological. That's to gain some insight. Then he said, come the moral qualities of the individual. Second is courage to address what needs to be addressed. And so that woman you were just describing at some point has to tell her mother, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. I love you, but <laughs> this is my choice. And you're going to have to respect that. And if you don't, there, there are consequences there. And then thirdly, over time, through endurance and perseverance, one lives one's life into a different place. And that's how we grow up. You know, there are not many grown-ups on the planet. And one of the keys to that is not, you know, obviously chronological maturity, because that doesn't quite solve the problem. We all know in, immature people who are elderly. But we have to find at some moment in our life the summons and the courage to grab hold of the summons to be here as you are and take that risk. And I'm not talking about narcissism. I'm not talking about self-indulgence. This whole thing is actually a challenging project. It's an intimidating project. And it's always a humbling project. So, you know, why would one even want to do it? And the answer is because something inside of you is constantly yearning for expression through you. And that's where we ultimately have to grow up. Am I going to be accountable for what wants expression through me? That's that's the key. I know what my parents want from me. I know what my complexes want from me. Now that they're deceased, I still have the complexes inside of me. I know what the culture wants from me. The question is, what does the soul want of me? And the day I forget that question, then I've become simply a, a, a series of stimulus responses and a kind of automatic pilot that's running the show and not my own life. So let's imagine that people are sitting or standing or walking or whatever they're doing to this podcast, mm -hmm. and they're realizing that they don't really know, and let's I'll stay with your image, what their soul wants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where do they start? Because this seems like a big journey. Sure. Well, first of all, I think one needs to remember that's the question to keep asking. What does the soul want of me? And by soul, I'm meaning it in the same way as the, it's the literal translation of the Greek word psyche. So our psychological reality is the expression of our soul. So what is wanting expression in the world through you? In other words, who are you as a person? Can you share that? Can you bring that person into being? Yes, if you had a specific interest or talent, do you have permission to pursue that? Uh, do you have permission to go out and make a fool of yourself? That's okay, too. To explore, to take risks, to see where things work and where they don't work in your life. You know, sooner or later, one has to realize this is, you know, why mortality is so important for us. Because it tells us this is the only life we get. And if you're not going to live this with some sort of integrity, why are you here? And in service to what? So we get sort of hints often about something might be important to us. I sort of call it sort of there's an extra energy there. There's a book that you read that is really compelling. There's a, a sentence that comes out of a podcast or, you know, you go to the theatre and you see something and it really grabs hold of you. There's a piece of music. I would call them sort of freighted moments. Is it important to look out for those? Of course, because why did that touch you? What was that about? And it leaves someone else indifferent, let's say. So why why has that touched you? Just to, to review for a moment, we have internal systems that tell us what's right and wrong for us, one of which is the feeling function. See, you and I don't choose our feelings. Feelings happen autonomously. We can anesthetize them. We can distract them. We can project them onto others. We can drown in them. But we don't create them. And let's say that you're trained for a certain career 
and you've achieved everything you wanted to achieve in that career. But while doing it on a daily basis, you're bored out of your mind. You know, there's no more energy there for you. And so your feeling function has, has told the truth and the energy system has told the truth. When you're d doing what's right for you, the energy is available. And when you're not doing what's right for you, you have to force it. And over time, as we know, if you have to keep forcing something, it leads to burnout and depression and self-medication and so forth. Thirdly, we have dreams. Our dreams respond to our daily life and offer commentaries if we stop and pay attention. But too often in our culture, we've, you know, learned to disregard them and just say, oh, it's froth. You know, and then fourthly is the question of meaning. You know, if what you're doing is meaningful, something in you really supports you, even if it's difficult. For example, people think that writing books is easy because I've written a lot of books. Well, why would they think that? Do you think writing a book is easy? Just sit down and sacrifice your evenings when you want to watch a sporting event or sit down when you have nothing to say and, and just stare at the screen until something starts speaking through you or whatever. As Thomas Mann said, writing is an act that is especially difficult for those who are writers. So if, if there's something in me that wishes expression, then I have to be willing to submit to it. It's not my ego gratification that it's about. It's about feeling the importance or the value or the necessity of serving that which wishes expression. So I, I just choose writing as one example, but people have different interests and different talents and different callings. But I think what is so difficult is often these clues, they're almost like breadcrumbs to follow, are mm -hmm. so small that people often miss them. And reading your books, and I've been reading your books for 10 years now, what comes across is your love of poetry. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if poetry has been a source of breadcrumbs for you that has actually guided you forward in any way, or am I just imagining that? No, no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I, I taught a course on um, poetry last spring here in Washington, D.C., and thanks to, um, you know, electronic capacity, we had 277 people sign up from around the world, and I'm going to do another one this September. And the point I'm making simply is this. Uh, poetry has always been, for me, one of the portals through which I try to approach the mystery. Why are we here in service to what? What's really running, you know, our choices? What is our summons in life? These are healthy questions. They're questions that get you your life. And if poetry or any other activity allows you insight into that, then you're well served by that. And it's not so much I'm in, using poetry as much as I'm, I'm experiencing it and allowing it to open doors for me. So I would say in not only poetry, but the arts themselves have been my secondary interest through the years. My wife happens to be a retired therapist and painter. She, her, some of her artwork has been on some book covers. And from her, I've learned a great deal about how the artist's eye looks at things that are differently than, than I do, for example. And that's broadened my range of possibilities of experiencing life. So that's one of the gifts of relationship. So using the image of ghosts, can we exorcise them? Well, I don't know that we ever wholly clear the house of all presence from the ghosts, but we also don't want them making the life decisions for you. And I'm just going to make up an example here, and it's a cliched example, but let's just say the person had a strong and domineering parent and their well-being in childhood depended at some level about being her or his orders and making them feel good about themselves rather than living the child's life. Well, flash forward a few decades. If that's still the story that's dominating your life, you're A, you're going to be miserable because every day you're, you're colluding with separation from yourself. Secondly, you're going to be living someone else's life, not your life. You're tending to their unfinished business. And thirdly, every time you invest in that, you're robbing your own possibilities of choice. And, you know, one has to, at some level, kill the power, not the parent, but kill the power 
Many, many, many years ago, when I was working in a psychiatric hospital as part of my training, there was a woman who drove up the state capitol building of one of the U.S. states and threw a sack down. And in the sack was the head of her mother. And when she was arrested, she said, now here's what you all have been waiting for, and I finally feel free. And I just happened to know the social worker who was assigned to her. And he said after that, she was she was fine. She was guilty of murder. But on the other hand, uh, she certainly dealt with her complex. And I'm not rep- recommending this to any of your listeners, obviously. But, but in a sense, what you have to kill is the power of that complex. You say, I have it. I would be delusional to think that it's not a presence in my life is if I may use, and this is risky, if I may use the example of of your parliament, you know, there are some backbenchers there who are going to be raising a fuss from time to time. So you need to know they're there and you can't silence them, but you have to realize I'm not turning the governance of this country over to them either. You know, there's some rotten boroughs in there too, by the way. Yes. I often put it like, you know, you're in a board meeting and you're prepared to hear from everybody around the board table, but you're not going to allow them to run the company. And if you actually refuse to listen to them altogether, they're just going to bang on the door and you won't get any blooming peace. So, you know, listen to them, let them give their presentation, but you don't have to accept it as gospel. That's right. That's right. Actually, I had a client once who every week when she came in would say, well, let me tell you what the kids have been up to this week. And that was her metaphor for saying, let me talk about those parts of myself, which she called the kids, that were acting out in the course of the week and making some decisions and behaviors that were not necessarily in her best interest. And her, you know, improvement, if I may use that word, or her growth, rose out of her capacity to identify those presences. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like being the CEO of the company, but it's there are all kinds of invisible partners, aren't there, who are there, they're voting, and they're saying, this is what we want you to do. And until they become conscious, they have a tremendous power. Nothing is more powerful than that of which you know not that is making a decision for you, you see. Nothing is more powerful than the things that you don't know. So it's very important to name these forces because otherwise you're probably going to recognize them in somebody else. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, it's one of the ways in which, uh, as Jung pointed out, we uh, run into the shadow. The shadow are those parts of our personality that we prefer not to deal with and don't want to accept about ourselves. And so we can easily see it in someone else and be critical of them and say, well, so-and-so is hypocritical or so-and-so is uh, always currying favor or, or whatever. And we disown that possibility within ourselves by displacing it outside of ourselves. In fact, we have to say what is going on in humanity is also going on in me as well. And so I, I have to pay attention to what are the various elements within my my psychic garden here that are blooming whether I wish them to or not. So in a moment, we're going to be looking at a letter, and that's after this. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. How can I help you have a better relationship? There's nothing I like better than talking to some of the world's top sex and relationship experts. It helps me learn and grow. And that's why I started this podcast. But what makes my life meaningful is writing and teaching. That's why I've written 20 books on relationships, which have been translated into 20 languages. They fall into two categories. Firstly, improve your relationships. In this category, I'd like to recommend Happy Couple Handbook, powerful love hacks for a successful relationship. I cover constructive arguing, be a better listener, use carrots rather than sticks, and how to forgive and move on. In the second category, which is called Rescue Your Relationship. I have books like I Love You But I'm Not In Love With You, my international bestseller, Can We Start Again? 50 Questions to Fall Back In Love, My Wife Doesn't Love Me Anymore, 
and my husband doesn't love me anymore and he's texting someone else. You can find out more about these books, along with details about how to get involved with the show and send in your question to be discussed with my guests at my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com. Rockstar Energy Punch, bringing a bold and unapologetic flavor packed with energy through a blend of B vitamins, guarana extract, and 240 milligrams of caffeine to fuel what's next. Rockstar Energy Drink. My name is Miles Morales. I'm the one and only Spider-Man. At least that's what I thought. You're like me. That's impossible. I'm Gwen Stacy. I'm from another, another dimension. How many more spider people are there? Whoa! A live concert event is coming to San Jose. Remember, what makes you different is what makes you Spider-Man. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse live in concert, November 13th. Get your family's tickets now at broadwaysanjose.com. So, if you would like to get involved with The Meaningful Life, there's all sorts of different ways of doing so. You can go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts, and you'll find out how to sign up for my newsletter. I've just recently done a very interesting newsletter about change and why we find change so difficult. You might like to read that, sign up, and you'll also find somewhere you can send a letter to us. And this is the letter that I've got for James. I've been in therapy transactional analysis for about six years. I found it helpful, but we need to end for other reasons. I'm entering into a foundation training where my therapist teaches, so now I'm thinking about something different. I have a growing interest in Jungian analysis, but I'm not sure why or how to go about getting into analysis. Can you help? I'd like to know how Jungian analysis might support my personal development, how to find an analyst, I'm based in the north of England, and also maybe how to know if I found a good one or rather a good helpful analytic alliance. Most of my questions are big and existential, although it is helpful to know my patterns. I'm drawn to what lies deep beneath and whether there is perhaps something in me, in my subconscious or shadow perhaps, that could illuminate something new. Any thoughts guidance gratefully received as Google is coming up with both too much and not enough. It's interesting how how Google does that really, isn't it? It it does. That's right. That's right. Well, first of all, I would suggest to this person that the questions that they have are important questions. They need to pursue them. And to undertake work with an analyst is really to try to evoke a conversation with those different aspects of one's own personality that are present and are making decisions for you. At least get some greater sense of who's in the House of Parliament here, what contending parties are at work here. And, you know, it takes you to a deeper place than a lot of behavioral and cognitive therapy will go. And behavioral and cognitive therapy is often problem-oriented, and that's useful and certainly helpful. But there comes a point where the large questions of life, how do I deal with suffering? How do I deal with loss? Uh, How do I deal with my self-crippling fears? Those invite a deeper conversation. And if the person's interested in Jungian analysis, certainly there are some good books out there to talk about it. But to think of it as a deepened conversation around the meaning of your own journey. And that, you know, there's no overt agenda. There's what comes up for you to bring to that session each time and to see what emerges from that. And the word analytic, going all the way back to the Greek, means to stir up from below. So it's meant to stir up some of that psychological history, to stir up the ghosts in the house, if you will, and to to then be able to, as you say, make them more conscious And if they're conscious, then I can address them, I can deal with them, I can negotiate with them. But if they're unconscious, they're eating my lunch, whether I know it or not. But secondly, if one wants to deal with the Jungian specifically, all the major cities have Jung societies of one kind or another, and I would contact them, and they usually have a list of Jungian analysts. There's a difference between a Jungian-oriented psychotherapist who could be a person who might have read a book or something like that and labeled themselves, To be an analyst is to have gone through years of one's personal analysis and to have 
passed exams of various kinds. And it's, you know, it's like a five to 10 year program, the postdoctoral program usually. So it's a very extensive training in which the emphasis is upon the self-awareness of the analyst. So I would go to the Jung societies or Jung institutes and ask them for suggestions. And then to remember, you're the consumer. And a lot of studies have indicated, and a lot of anecdotal material, is it's less the theory that makes the determinant in a therapy. It's, it's more your chemistry with that person. Is this a person you work well with, that you can trust, who also is both supportive but pushes you at some point? And if that's missing, it, it, it'll be too passive. So one has to realize this is a deepened conversation with someone who is going to be there not to tell you what to do in any way or to reduce things to, I mean, I hate the word shrink, for example. There's nothing shrinking here. It's quite the contrary. It's about freeing up energies for fuller life expression. So it's quite the contrary to shrinkage. But to, to realize that ultimately this is an investment in one oneself and that this this work is, as I've often said, to make your life more interesting to you, to realize every day you wake up, decisions are being made, large life-altering decisions. And if you're not making them consciously, who or what's making those decisions for you? I love that idea of making your life more interesting because I'm in analysis and I've been in it for about three years or so. But I mean, what stopped me for a very long time was just the thought of, you know, was I interesting enough? You know, what on earth would I talk about? And it sort of, <laughs> it took a bit of courage to actually believe that I would be interested enough in myself, if that makes any, I know sure. it sounds really weird, but that's, that was something that held me back for a very long time. No, I understand that. In, in a recent book called The Broken Mirror, and the, the metaphor of the title was about how difficult it really is to see oneself in the fractured surfaces that reflect themselves to us. I mentioned three particular areas where we are our own worst enemy. One is fear to say, oh, this just intimidates me. I don't want to look into myself. I'd rather deal with, you know, what is, is safe and unknown. It's okay. Well, you live a safe, cloistered and sheltered life, but it's going to be half a life. Uh, secondly, is what I call the moi complex. It's like me. You want me to do that? Right. As you were just saying, that was an example of the moi complex. I'm not interesting enough. Well, why would you think that? That's a complex speaking, right? Everybody's life is interesting. Everybody's soul is up for grabs at some level. And, and then thirdly, it's hard work over time. You have to really pay attention. The word therapy from the, the original Greek means to listen to or to attend to. Psyche, the soul, means to listen or attend to the soul over time. And that's hard work, and it's humbling work. No wonder nobody wants to do it. And yet the alternative is to be living on automatic pilot. The alternative is to be giving one's sovereignty over to the ghost in the house. So let's imagine that she finds somebody. How long before you sort of know if you've got a relationship that's actually going to work? Because I don't think you can tell in one session, but... Do you have to wait 10 sessions? I don't know. What's your yeah. thought? Put a label on it. <laughs> I have an English colleague who went to a, a senior analyst in London who said he knew in the first hour that it was a mismatch. And so he never went back. And so remember, you're the consumer. So you're not there to please that person. You're there to see if they can be helpful to you. And I think it's a number of sessions one begins to see is how is one's psyche responding to this, you know. And if you find a lot of resistance emerging, that can be the subject matter, of course, of one's conversation with that analyst, you see, because that person is understands that the resistance that is there is part of the sort of reactivation of that long history that's been governing that individual's life. But it's really difficult to talk to your therapist about your relationship with them. It's one of the most difficult subjects. I mean, sure. it's a really fruitful one and a really useful one, but it's, it's sure. really difficult, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I'm trained to go to difficult subjects. I encourage my clients to come to me with difficult subjects, but 
when I was sitting the other way round and I had to, you know, say, talk about my relationship with my analyst, whew, you know, yeah. I could feel, I, I think I felt about five years old talking to my parents again. Sure. And I was going to make the analogy that it's not unlike having a difficult conversation with your parents where you respectfully disagree and you move in a different direction. You're not there to please that person. That's simply a transferential phenomenon from the old parent-child relationship. It's understandable, but that's not why the two of you are together. So we've been talking a lot about ghosts. Are you still haunted by ghosts? Do you think now? Of course, of course. That's why I said that the ghosts never wholly go away, but one becomes more aware of their presence. And, you know, again, remember to anybody listening, we're speaking metaphorically here. To talk about a ghost is really to personify certain clusters of energy that we have in us because we have a life history. The question then could be framed in a different way. What is your history? And how does it influence your present uh, life? How is it making choices for you? I mean, that's a very value-neutral way of saying it, but I think everybody can understand that. Oh, well, then that makes a lot of sense to me that I should pay attention to what other elements are are making choices for me. And then, then you have an introduction to your own complexity. Now, in your author biography, you write about being a husband, having three living children and eight grandchildren. And Mm -hmm. every time I read your biography, I'm always struck by that phrase, three living children. Do you think a lot about the child who's no longer living? Every day. His picture is right above my screen here. So um, why would I not think of him? He was one of my best friends. And I miss him on a, on a daily basis, and I also think of him in a way to inspire me to, you know, stay active, busy. And I don't mean busy, busy. I mean, in a sense, engaged in the things that mattered to both of us and continue to matter to both of us. So death does not end relationships. So you can have positive hauntings too. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I also have photographs of two deceased friends right above me here, and they are positive hauntings too. You know, one's the poet Stephen Dunn, who just passed away two years ago, and he was one of my best friends. And, you know, we used to have an ongoing conversation for 47 years, and you don't, you don't forget that. And the conversation goes on. As I said, death does not end relationships. So normally at this point, I ask my witnesses on The Meaningful Life what makes their life meaningful. But as I've already asked you that question, I'm going to put it in a slightly different way, the way that you put it, which is, what is seeking to come into the world through me? So that's the question I'm going to ask you today. What is trying to come into the world through you? Well, again, that's a question that I address every day. I happen to be at this moment 83, medically compromised. I've been dealing with two cancers and with the collapse of my spine and major surgeries that deal with that and chronic pain. And so the last two or three years have been largely influenced by medical circumstances. We recently moved into a retirement center, partly because of uncertainty of medical prognosis. But that all said, I just had a book come out, and I just sent off the manuscript of the next book. So I'm working, I would say, half-time with clients. I'm doing interviews, as this one is, and I'm writing, and I'm still learning. So it's like life is still to be served, and where it's going to take me, I don't know. I I keep thinking I've said everything there is to say, at least from my perspective, but then something inside starts nudging me, and guess what? I sit down and start writing again. So, you know, (laughs) we swim in a mystery and we have to ask ourselves, what is that mystery about? You know, Jung said life is a short pause between two great mysteries. Well, all right, what is this pause about for you? And what are you supposed to do with this pause? And how are you to honor it and fulfill it in a non-ego driven way? Well, then then you're really asking questions of meaning, purpose, vocation and, and so forth. And. Those questions never, never end. So um, I'm redefining my life now in terms of physical energy, uh, pain management, uh, living in a retirement center, 
a number of constrictions that maybe were not there two years ago. But, you know, the spirit's alive, and who knows where it's going to take me the next time. All I, all I have to do is, is be respectful of it, pay attention, and, and see what life is asking of you. So that's where the conversation ends, unless you're a supporter of The Meaningful Life, because we're then going to, in that, look at another of the themes of James's current book, Relocating Your Centre of Spiritual Gravity. So if you want to hear the bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify, and we're also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and unlock the bonus material this way, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you. Aumenta el desempeño de tu vehículo y ahorra gasolina con O'Reilly Auto Parts y Lucas. Llévate dos botellas de tratamiento para combustible Lucas por solo 10 dólares. Además, obtén puntos dobles o rewards con esta oferta. Detalles en la tienda. Realiza tus compras en tu tienda O'Reilly Auto Parts más cercana o visita O'ReillyAuto.com. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. Rockstar Energy Punch, bringing a bold and unapologetic flavor packed with energy through a blend of B vitamins, guarana extract, and 240 milligrams of caffeine to fuel what's next. Rockstar Energy Drink. What if there was a university on the train? An accounting class under the one shady spot at soccer practice. Imagine if every waiting room was actually a classroom. The doctor will see you now. What if you could pick the time and the place that works for you and college would just appear? UMass Global offers 100% online classes, short eight-week courses, and personalized support to help you succeed in college, wherever you are in life. Major in your future. Visit umassglobal.edu to apply.